welcome back, wannabes and creators, to another episode of The Complete Creative, the podcast that helps you build and sustain a better creative business. Today on the show, we have New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Deborah Holland. Now, Deborah has written dozens of novels, as well as being a licensed psychotherapist. So I thought it would be amazing to bring her on to talk about the mindset of having success in any creative field, how to survive burnout, and just how to live a more complete creative life. Before I get into it, I want to remind you that I have an entire website devoted to building a complete creative life called The Complete Creative. It is the companion piece to this podcast. You can head on over to thecompletecreative.com and check out all of our courses, our uh, epic blog posts, my daily blog, and a whole lot more. I have an absolutely free 10-day course, for instance, on exactly how to build a creative business from scratch. It's all email-based. It comes to you once a day for 10 days, and you can get it at thecompletecreative.com forward slash FBC. All right. That being said, now let's get on with the show. Take it away, Deborah. Tell us what you're passionate about these days. Well, do you want a list? Uh, I actually do a lot of things. So in addition to writing and publishing and having my own publishing company, I'm also a psychotherapist and a corporate crisis and grief counselor. And I've had one company keeping me very, very busy. And one of the things we're dealing a lot with in Southern California is a lot of homeless, transient drug populations coming into stores and retail places and, you know, and causing some havoc with customers and staff and scaring people. And, and how do we, so the, the question for people a lot of times is how do we stay compassionate and at, at the same time have to set boundaries and, and try to deal with people in a professional way. So that's one of my passions. <laughs> The other is my publishing company right now. It's really probably very gratifying to help other authors succeed and polish their work to the best that they can. So it can go out there and hopefully make some ripples in the reader's minds. So I think that would be those two places is where I'm putting a lot of my energy you th that brings up a question that I hear a lot, um, kind of kind of related to the compassion part of it and how do you maintain compassion while still, you know, running a business? It's a huge thing for a lot of younger, even established creative people. And I'd love for you to you know, talk a little bit about how you can mold those two things together. Keep your compassion while still, you know, looking out for your bottom line. Well, I think the biggest th sort of, it's not so much butting heads, but maybe walls that my poor authors run into is that I'm a really tough editor, really tough. I'm a really good editor, really tough editor. Don't particularly like doing it, but I'm really good at it, which I blame my own editors for. So it's all their fault. And so they'll turn in a manuscript and they'll get it back and it's totally marked up or, you know, full of track changes and stuff like that. And, and their first, even though I warn them, their first reaction is, you know, oh my goodness. It's like, what, you know, no, that she's taking my story and she's changing. Well, I'm not changing their story. I might be saying in the latest case, it was you're starting your story way too late. You have all this very exciting stuff happening that's happening off the page, happens before the story starts and really motivates your story. And you need to put this in. You know, you often, Authors are told, you're actually starting, you need to start much later, you need to start much closer to the actual action. And in this case, it was, you have the action going, and we don't know about it, because you're just telling us. So I made her go back and write like a chapter and a half. And, and, and that was sort of hard. But when she actually did it, she's like, Oh, my gosh, I, I love the changes. I love my story. And it was hard for her, because she'd always envisioned when she started the story, she envisioned the first scene was a hero 
riding on horseback because mine are historicals riding horseback into this snowy valley and seeing this cabin and I'm like okay well it's her point of view <laughs> she's back up put it in her point of view she's the one who's getting chased and you know as her life is at risk and you need to start in her point of view and you need to start back you know so that's the kind of thing and I have had a couple authors go I can't do this you know, I, it's, it's too hard. You, I, and I'm like, okay, I'll let you out of your contract. So that is, that is one of the harder things, but it's also, hopefully they're seeing that we're going, this will make it better. This will make it better. I believe in you. I believe in your story. I have to give them that message very strongly and we're going to make it better. And I know what this is like, believe me, I have been through this myself. So, and I usually tell them the story of my first book and, and how it's a romance, historical romance set in the 1880s and 1890s. And when I first started getting feedback from published authors who are readers and in contests, it was like, okay, your hero and heroine are meeting too late. And I happened to be at a Romance Writers of America a chapter, which is one is in Orange County and it's a very strong chapter. And our speaker that day wrote historicals and she, even though hers were Scottish, one of the things that she invited us to do was email her with questions. So I emailed her and said, is page 56 too late for a hero and heroine to meet? And she wrote me back and said, yes. I'm like, ah, so I pouted for like three weeks and like, I like my book the way it is. I don't want to change it. And just sort of had the, I don't want us. And, but in the back of my mind was, sort of figuring it out and at the end of three weeks I actually came up with a way to change it and making those changes put that book a few months later it became a romance writers of america golden heart finalist and it went on to win and that sort of started my career because i got really tough feedback that made me change the book and made me dig my heels in but finally accept it so that's sort of what, that's my compassion at stake. I, I know what it's like. Yeah. I, uh, I always get the same feed, the, the same reaction every time. Like I'm paying the editor. I hired the editor. I got the editor notes back and I still like get that same like gut reaction when I first read the book. Like even though she's done a dozen books from over a dozen books for me now, like she doesn't know what she's talking about. Like this book was perfect when, it, even though intellectually it's so hard, even now after a dozen, after dozens of books and dozens of edits that I've gotten back to, to have that feeling of like, uh, 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 to, 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 to mold the intellectual part of your brain with that, that like gut reaction and not freak out immediately. Uh-huh. Yeah, luckily, I don't usually get too much of that um, anymore. <laughs> um, my editor has been with me from, from day one, so she was the editor in the very first book and knows my writing, knows me well, well knows my, you know, my community and, my, and everything, you know, all my different heroes and heroes and characters. And, and so I usually have a pretty strong t- t- trust in her when she says, you know, okay, this hero is not sympathetic or, um, you know, you're going up too, you know, too far into this and, you know, we're, you're sort of losing this particular character. Or, so it's not luckily big to, to change up your book kind of stuff anymore. Uh, what I do find is, you know, she'll go in and she's the kind of editor that actually will write her suggestions. So if she thinks I need some dialogue in some place, she'll write it out. And I'll either look at it and go, okay, she's right. And I will just verbatim sort of change what she says. Or I'll say, okay, she's drawn my attention to this problem. And I agree with her that this is a problem. Totally don't agree with her suggestion. I'll do it a totally different way. So I'd say probably 85% of the time I just go with what she says. And the other 15 I go, well, actually, let's change the math a little. (laughs) The other 13 I go, no, I'm going to change it differently. And then there's about 2% that I go, she misread something. And, and what she just told me to do is totally, she totally missed that. I actually did this four paragraphs ago or something. So I totally disregard it. 
Yeah, I think that's about that's about accurate to what uh, to what mine is. Mostly like eighty five to ninety percent of just like, yep, she's right here, and then like a little bit of uh, I'll change it a different way, and a little bit of like, well, I like I don't think that she was right here, but I maybe get out of a out of a, out of a whole manuscript one or two times that may, maybe it's one time, and on a, on a, on a, on a, on a it's between one and two times at most that she that I like disagree with the note that she made. And most of the time I just like change it immediately to whatever she suggests because her suggestion is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's so good to have an editor that, that you can trust like that. And, you know, sometimes it takes time to build the trust and to go, OK, I can just put my book in her hands and just go, it's it's going to be OK, as opposed to. You don't know what you're talking about. And I did have an editor when I transitioned from indie publishing. I was acquired by an Amazon imprint called Montlake Romance. And so here I had Wild Montana Sky. That's the first book that I've been describing. And it had been an indie book. It sold almost 100,000 books at that time. And so even though it was a polished book, they still put it through their normal editing process. And my acquiring editor had told me when she got the books as part of our agreement that she would respect my vision of the books. They were, it was working and she was going to be sort of very hands off. And so I got these, this one editor's feedback and she goes, oh, you need to make it more clear that the other g- guy is, is not the love interest and you have to change this and this. And I'm like, going, F you. <laughs> Not And I luckily didn't have to worry about it because I knew my acquiring editor would back me up. I paid no attention to her edits. I'm like, you don't get it. This yeah. is not on it and this is staying. Yeah, well, it must it must help. I mean, you've had uh, over two dozen books now, at least, my count, in one series, plus a couple of others, at least. It must help if that editor has been with you since the beginning that, like, you've seen that all the things that she's done has made the book stronger and it sells. It still it sells. And so a lot of times now that I've done, you know, a dozen books and I've seen that whatever she says works, if it's like on the fence, I often just defer to uh, her judgment a lot of times because like I know like she's got the fresh eyes that I didn't have when I wrote it right and sometimes I might ask because I actually go through three editing passes with three different editors and so sometimes I might ask I'll wait until editor number two I won't change it or it won't change it very much and then I'll wait until editor number two actually reads it and then I'll then I'll ask her. I don't ask her beforehand because I don't want to put the idea in her head. But I ask her afterwards. I said, okay, what did you think of the beginning of that scene? Did it strike you as X, Y, Z? Because that's what, you know, Lou said in the first time. And so I'll get a second opinion if I totally disagree. And, you know, she might have different ideas or she might say I liked it or she might say, you know, change this in a different way. So... But yeah, usually if I really disagree, but it's something enough that I'll just get another opinion. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what do you think is that you said you do a lot of editing for your for your uh, for your um, uh, uh, authors? Is there a mistake or a couple of mistakes that you see them make most often, or that you see earlier authors make a lot? Well, you know, I'm gonna I'll give you a list. I actually uh, brought up an, brought another editor on board. And I just sent her a list just sort of off the top of my head yesterday of going, these are some things I'm, I'm seeing over and over again that I'm having to mark. Some of them are small and some of them, you know, like the kind of commas I like. And, and you know, like I, I, I like a compound comma, meaning between two sentences that are attached as one. I like to have the comma there, that kind of thing. But I also see a lot of the use of it instead of a more active word. Although I must say that when I go back and look at my earlier work, I have more it's on them than I do now. But I'm just, like in my last author that I edited, I was like, what I ended up doing was like highlighting them on the page so that she could look at a page and go, oh my gosh, it looks like it has, you know, yellow chicken pox or something. And, you know, I would even said to her, I said, you need to minimize your it's. 
And then so she would send another version. And I'm like, ah, oh, they're still there. You know, and I would mark them again. And then finally I'm like, all right, obviously not clear communication. Next time I need to go, I want you to do a search for all your it's. And then I want you to replace them. And only if you cannot think of a different, more active word, more descriptive word, are you allowed to keep it? And I do that too with myself. And luckily my, my line editor is really good at, she might think of a word that I wasn't able to think of. So I'll leave it in my own manuscript and she'll change it because she did. And I'm like, Oh good. She got, she got it. Hmm. And then I'm like, Oh, that was so obvious. How come I didn't think of that? So what, what else? I don't like as in the middle of a sentence because I think it usually throws off the timing and the part that's at the end of the sentence usually should be in the beginning. Now, I don't know. Was that clear at all <laughs> when I said that? So when you say, so you usually need to say as something happens first. So as comes in the very beginning of the sentence and if it's in the middle, Check it. Check your timing on each part of the sentence and see which one comes first and which one comes second. So in order for the second thing to happen, it's like I have to see something before I can react to it. And if I'm reacting before I see it, that the timing is wrong. Is that making sense? Yes. No, absolutely. I actually try to keep as and like and any sort of simile stuff out of a manuscript at all. Yeah, and I also want, don't want like a whole bunch of them in one paragraph or the several paragraphs together. I want scene setting, especially with a historical. It's important. And I have my books are set in Montana and in the, again, 1880s, 1890s. And I really want to give my readers a sense of time and place. And that is one of the things that my readers like. That was when I was writing the third book, I'd already published the, I had written the first two many years before I indie published them. And I hadn't finished the third one. So I was working on the third one and I was typing in these scene setting details and the New York editor on my shoulder said, you're putting in too many details. You're slowing down the pacing. And I stopped and I thought about it for a minute. And I said to the editor on my shoulder, you know, I have review after review that praises that the way that I bring them into the story, that I help them, that they like the visuals, they like the scene setting, they like the time and place. And so I flicked that editor off my shoulder and went back to typing more screen setting, scene setting and never looked back. So I want that same thing in my, my author's books as well. I want transitions, even if they're short, so characters have to move from one place to the other. They can't be in one side of the room and all of a sudden they're on the other side of the room. They have to have moved there somehow, even if they just move. And even if it's just a little short thing, they can't just be bopping around without movement. And also think through the movement. So you're not going to, if you're picking up a cup to sip, sip, or you're pouring your tea, picking the cup up, putting it to your mouth, you're not putting it to your mouth first and then pouring it, the tea into your cup. So watch that kind of transitions because people actually, without really thinking of it, the, th the scene is so clear in their heads and the movement of their characters is so clear in their heads that they're not necessarily realizing what's not getting down on paper as clearly. Um, I spend a lot of time cutting repetitions and then I'm and moving sentence, sentences around so that the flow is better. So, so think through this. It's like, okay, you already told us this five paragraphs back. So we either don't need this or the second part of the paragraph that you put in that's new information can actually be put with the original mention. Keep the, and I say, keep the use of was or be, had been to only when it's necessary Watch for repetitive words within a paragraph or several paragraphs. Uh, and I watch for a period correct language. A lot of the time people will put in words. I'm like, this is modern. We don't think about this as modern, but it is modern. And, and I also, for myself, do a lot of checking to make sure if I'm going to use a word, 
make sure that it was in usage in the 1880s and 90s. And sometimes I really want that word and it's not. And I just go, ah, can't use it. It, was, it wasn't around then. So I'm very careful about that. So that's just a small list of just sort of the basics. Yeah, I really like how you uh, how you talked about you, you sort of you talked in the middle about how you're looking for scene descriptions because your fans like your screen scene descriptions. And I really um, because your fans are the ones that are going to be not all exclusively, but a lot of them are going to be trusting you when you put out a book for your line and you know what those fans like. So you're bringing a lot of that to these authors books as well whereas another person might have a whole different set of things that they're looking for because their fans like something completely different in their work mm -hmm. right in my books they're romances but they're not sexy romances or what's called sweet romances meaning th that they don't have sex you know they get married first and you know i don't so you know i'll have a few kisses it's pretty it's pretty chaste and so if all of those are going to drop sex scenes into the middle of my books, my fans would be going, oh, my God. Some of them would be fine with it, but many of them would go, that's not what I expected when I picked up your book. I love that you used the word expected because that's sort of what we're setting with um, with our with our, our careers, right? We're trying to set the expectation of what somebody is going to get when they pick up our book. That's what the blurb is and the cover is. And as you become, you know, as you have a series of books or even multiple series of books, you know, there's an expectation of what those people are. And the more you can fit that expectation, the more the e more easily those people are going to transition to your next series. Would you right. say that's true? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the, they might expect a little bit different, you know, and that you can convey that with your blurb and your covers being, like, different from your original series. Um, I have a book, not the one I'm currently writing, but the one after is one I don't even know if I'll ever write. And I, I decided to, I was going to start dropping hints in the back of my books when I have – I usually have a letter to my readers at the very end, and – I'm saying I have another book coming. It's it's more dark. It's a darker book, you know, darker topic, darker things are happening. Um, and I actually I'm going to switch back and forth between historical past and contemporary because people die. <laughs> My main characters die, you know, they die. And I'm like, okay, that's just not a romance. And so I have to switch to the present, I think, to pull the romance, make the romance be in the present. And so it's going to be a very, very different book. Um, and it also has a black hero. And in those days, you didn't have a, a man, a black man, and a white woman. It was just would have caused so much scandal. And in order to do that, I have to portray the reality of, of their story, what their life would have been like in those days. And I'm like, that would <laughs> be like so controversial. So... Maybe that won't get written, but I'm going to start mentioning it to the readers. So at least if I ever do write it, they'll they know what's coming. And so I've had a few of them write to me and go, please write that story. I can take it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we well, you also have, uh, if I saw your, if I write your website correctly, it looked like you had a, a space opera series as well. That was completely different from your historical romance series. Yes. I have a fantasy, I have a fantasy trilogy with a, post story after that and I'm actually in the process of transitioning it away from a trilogy and into an actual series because there's more in it I want to write but it's interesting because I don't have a lot of crossover readers I'll have a few and it was a big surprise for me when I, fir I published the first two of my western historicals so I first so indie published Wild Montana Sky and Starry Montana Sky and they did. They took off. They did really, really well from the very beginning. So when I, about four or five months later, published the two first two fantasies, I expected the same thing, and I was really shocked that that didn't happen. So it's always been my little sort of tr way trailing behind sales. So I did finish the third one just because I owed it to my fans to finish the actual trilogy, and then wrote another follow-up story to that. But I haven't continued writing in it because it, they, they just aren't selling in the same way. 
So, and I have a space opera, which I've got a couple requests for, for traditional publishing. So I might go that direction with it. Yeah. That's so interesting. So interesting to hear other people talk about their, their, pro their, uh, struggles, uh, getting out of the genre that they are known for, uh, even if they're quite well known for a specific genre, I had a similar problem, uh, just moving from sci-fi to, uh, fantasy to sci-fi, uh, where I would, I have these books, I do a lot of conventions. So I like, I, I, I would see them sitting on the table and I would see people picking up literally every other book, except for these, like, two books that are sci-fi and they would be gobbling up in every show for a year. I would have them on a table and they just would be always the last two books that were left, even though they are equal or better than other books that are on my table, uh, just because that wasn't the expectation for the fans. And because the fans were eating up all of these other books, it prevented me from going back and dealing with these sci-fi, more sci-fi books simply because like, I was making, I'm making money on the other thing. And that's where I have to put my effort into. Right. You know, and the ironic thing is, you know, over the years and also with the audiobooks, which have done really well, is I have made more money on those books than I probably would have if I had, had a traditional deal with them. It's just that I make way, way more money on the other books. So it makes more sense to keep writing them. But I'm also at the point where my backlist the books I've already written and are for sale does really well on its own. So I have the luxury now of starting going, all right, maybe I'll, maybe I'll finish that space opera. So my uncle keeps going, how long are you going to leave that woman and that girl in prison in the, on that planet? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. It's been That's a bunch of years. <laughs> it might be a bunch more. We'll see. Maybe, maybe soon I'll, I'll work on freeing her. Yeah, well, I like to th I, I, when I talk to younger uh, authors or other creatives, I tell them like you if you're if, for somebody that is making, you know, good money on one genre or has a big fandom in one genre, maybe they can jump genres and still maintain a good, uh, you know, a good uh, fan base from that or still be able to grow a good fan base. Sort of like, you know, Jared Leto does that like Joker does that Joker movie and he does like the little indie movies and he still gets paid for both. He just like gets paid considerably less for the the, the indie movies that he really, really wants to write to, to make. And so uh, when you're when you're at the beginning of your career, like and you're trying to switch to 50 different genres or 50 things instead of pushing down on one sort of genre, it becomes really hard because you might have more fans in one genre to another, but neither of those fandoms are big enough to like pay your bills. Right. And I think too, that there is something when you're in the beginning to sort of see what hits first. I know for me, it was bouncing around between screenplays and nonfiction, several different kinds of nonfiction, several different kinds of fiction. And, and what, I, and actually nonfiction was the very first thing I sold. I sold the, a book called The Essential Guide to Grief and Grieving, and that was my first traditionally published book. So but then any publishing hit, and I started doing that, and that took off, and that's where I stayed. But I would tell most beginning writers, I'd say, well, first of all, learn your craft. <laughs> Don't even think about publishing, learn your craft. But once you're at that point of your book is done, it's well edited, it's ready to go, uh, you might even hold off and write another two before you even indie publish you know, so that you have several and you have, you're already appearing like you're a professional and, and you're just going to go, okay, there's not just one book. That's all they have. How do I know they'll ever write more books in the series? And so they'll trust you more. So you'll have more momentum from the beginning. And unless you're a very fast off writer, and there are plenty that are fast it's harder to maintain several series at once. I know people who do it and do it very, very well. They're just very dedicated, you know, and are able to write anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000 words a day. And they're able to put out, here's this book in this series, here's this book in this series, and there's that one in that series. And that's harder to do when you're, when you're new. Absolutely. And uh, I, I do like that you were talking about doing doing a bunch of things and seeing what hits, because frankly, at the beginning, you don't know what 
people are going to respond to. So, I mean, I think I, I was doing screenplays, too, and I did like thrillers and romantic comedies and fantasy and sci fi. And and then like I, I sort of hit a stride with this sort of like dark, darker fantasy, funny fantasy uh, uh, genre. And that started to pick up. And then uh, luckily, I had already written a lot of this other stuff and other genres. I wasn't like spending a bunch of time doing it afterwards. Uh, but then uh, when it started to hit, that was where the momentum carried me. And you could and, and then it became a lot easier to invest more money and more time and energy into that specific genre because I had a bu tried a bunch of stuff and I saw what was working the best and what I liked best also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, right. What's really, what's really the book of your heart or the, you know, the media of your heart, if it's screenplays or if it's a book or, or whatever. And sort of really drill down on that and, and that doesn't mean you can't do other things as well and, and write other things and, and should write other things. But maybe you have 70 percent of your writing time goes into your main projects and 30 percent goes into other projects. All right. I want to uh, to switch gears a little bit uh, because you are also a licensed psychotherapist and you had a book that I saw on your website about gratitude. Uh, and I've been uh slightly obsessed with this concept this year so far i just heard a happiness lab episode about gratitude versus willpower and how and the end of last year was all about like sort of just coming to helping the depression and anxiety that i deal with uh, all day by just like spending time every day uh, uh thinking about things that i'm grateful for mm -hmm. well the thing about gratitude is it actually lights up your brain in a different way so if you're feeling stressed or anxious or even, you know, very afraid, like traumatized afraid, if you go to to gratitude, then that's going to help change your brain. It's going to help pull you out of that negative thinking or, or whatever's going on with you into a better place. And so stopping and reframing things, a lot of times when I work with people, they've been, they've been traumatized. And so, for example, bank robbery. And so they might start talking to me and say, oh my God, it could have been killed. And in their mind, they've got this movie playing of them being shot or killed and their kids are now without a mom or dad and there's blood and guts everywhere. And the first thing I have to do is go, stop, stop. It didn't happen. You're fine. It didn't happen. And when you replay that movie, that's so traumatic, your, and your body, your heart starts to beat and, and your breath comes really short and and your, your brain starts to think it's real. So you are traumatizing yourself over and over again. I said, instead, this is what I want you to do. I want you to think of gratitude. And then I explain what I just had said about the brain. And I said, instead of going to, oh, my God, I could have been killed. Instead, go, I'm so grateful I am safe. I'm so grateful we were safe. You're spiritual. I'm so grateful we were protected or God protected us, or angels protected us, however you want to think about it. So in that moment, I might take deep breaths, think of gratitude. And you just I can just visually watch them calm. And that's what we need to do. And that's, you know, that's a more extreme case. But we do that all the time. In our minds with anxiety, it's really about catastrophizing stuff, little stuff, big stuff, all kinds of stuff that will never happen. <laughs> and here we are stressing ourselves and our brain is going, okay, body, gear up. Here we go. We're going to fight whatever this is. Instead of taking the deep breaths and going, I am really grateful right now. Everything's okay. None of those things I'm picturing are happening. Take a deep breath. I might not like my life very much right now, but you know what? I'm Okay. We're okay. I'm okay. And you're talking to yourself. You might say that to a little kid inside yourself. We're okay. It's okay. It's okay. We're okay. No need to go there. Take some deep breaths. What are we grateful for? So there you have it. I love it. Uh, I, I, something I struggle with uh, because, I mean, I, I deal with a lot of creatives and uh, I'm curious to know your uh, why you think that uh, so many creatives have this these struggles with like depression, anxiety, and burnout. And is it is it sort of uh, 
is it more uh, uh, of the entrepreneurial part of it or is it more uh, just something that is uh, that is uh, 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 I'm sure it's not something that's unique to the creative brain. But could you talk a little about uh, that word salad that I just mentioned? Yeah, well, let's pull out burnout and, and make it a separate topic. So remind me to come back to that one and let's do um, creativity. So a lot of times I'll be talking to somebody, you know, counseling them, and they start telling me you know, the, the, the issues that, you know, what they thought when whatever traumatic thing or scary thing happened. And I can really see how they describe it and, and the visual that's going on in their head and I, that they're a very creative person. And so I stop them and I usually say, uh, do you do other creative things in your life? And they might say no. And I said, oh, really? You know, like, what do you like to cook? How are you, you know, do that if you're a guy? Are you good with like car engines? <laughs> or you know, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of creativity in life that we don't think of as creative. That really is. So I might have to sort of probe a little bit to find out. And, and what I say is, you know, and I put my hands together and I sort of do a visual with this. I, and I say, when you're creative, when you have this, this visual brain, you're very creative and you're able to picture things and, and, and see things and, and go, okay, I want to, I want to create that, whether it's a meal for my family or a book or a piece of art. And the flip side of that is we're equally able to visualize these horrible movies coming true. And when we can visualize them in such a great extent, our body and our brain thinks it's real. And so we continue with our creative ability, we continue to stress ourselves. So part of what you need to do when you're creative is catch yourself playing the movie. And then you need to stop it, which is very easy to tell you, not so easy to do. So it's learning to go, stop, I'm making this up. I'm stressing myself up. I'm creating dark things, bad things, and I need to take some deep breaths. I'm, t I'm really tight right now. My body's really tight because I've just geared up for whatever scary thing I've said. So take some deep breaths and say to yourself, I'm okay. It's okay. I'm making this up. And then your brain might want to argue with you and go, but it could come true. It's like, take another deep breath. Yeah. If it does, we'll worry about it then. Right now, let's take some deep breaths. But what if, okay, stop. All right. Let's think through it once. Let's figure out this bad thing happens, what you'll do. Think it through, figure it out, and then stop. You've got it figured out. Stop. You're not allowed to think about it again. It's done. Take a deep breath. You're okay. So it's that kind of self-talk, that kind of breathing that's very important when you are anxious and depressed. That's so insightful. Like my eyes lit up because my wife is not creative at all and she doesn't have the same problems that I have. And she says that, uh, you know, she does meditation a lot in the morning and she's like that, that, that sets me for the whole day. But I have never found meditation to work for me because, uh, it's not in the morning that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, that, 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 that stuff happens. It like comes on as a flood, like at re random times throughout the day. So possibly or hopefully like doing that when it actually comes on could be more helpful for me than I have found meditation to be as of yet. Yeah, and I think for some people, and I, I'm one of them, I have a hard time with meditation. I think it's because it, it's really hard for me to calm my brain because my brain likes to do all sorts of things. So rather than trying to meditate, I'll do a guided meditation. So instead of, let me get more clear, instead of doing a clear your head kind of 10 to hour long meditation, I will pop on the internet or pop on the app and have somebody talk me through something that's soothing, calming, or inspirational and do the deep breathing with that. Oh, that makes so much sense. Um, 
that that like I. I'm sitting here like thinking of all of the things because I have a similar problem, whereas like I actually get more anxious when I'm just trying to meditate because then my brain has nothing to do except go to like the worst case scenario of what will happen in the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And see, it, it, and that's when you say to yourself, OK, look at what I just did. Is And, and, you, and you, you adopt a, what I call more almost like a curious response to it to like, Oh, look what I just did. I just made something up that was really negative. And look at my body. I just tightened my body. I'm holding my breath and not breathing deeply. All because of what I just made up. Wow. Take a deep breath. Tell myself that kind of creativity belongs in my manuscripts. Maybe I need to take that feeling and put it into the story someplace while it's fresh and real and not put it into my life. Yes. I, uh, I, I, I saw, I read something last year that was, uh, that was talking about looking at yourself, like when something happens like that, to look at yourself, like as, as a third, like outside of yourself, like how interesting that you do, that you're that thing now. And it, it has actually been really helpful for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, I want to remind you to get back to burnout because uh, you asked oh, me to burnout. remind you we want to talk about that as well. OK, so the, my conceptualization of burnout actually happened when I was in college and actually burned myself out and and sort of watched how after I did that, um, the world seemed a lot grayer and heavier. And what I sort of realized and I was in therapy at the time, which was helpful, was how I came to see it is like we have this sort of, if you look at your body and visualize this big fat oval, long oval in the middle of your chest into your stomach. And that's our core energy that we all have the core energy. And then around it sort of like a fuzzy halo is our sort of day to day energy. And when we're busy and stressed and things pile on us, we start, we use up that fuzzy halo of energy that's our day-to-day energy and if we don't replenish it at some point we start to tap into our core energy and when we tap into our core energy that energy is not easily replaced that energy gets replaced only with a lot more you know when I say work work meaning you have to stop working and you have to rest and you have to do creative and calming and loving and replenishing kind of things. And so that's what I think burnout is. Burnout is using up your sort of regular day-to-day energy and then starting to tap into your core energy and, and depleting yourself. And adding that is, are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? Most writers, but not all, most of us tend to be introverts, meaning we replenish through solitude and solitary activities. And when we're out being social, as fun as that might be, especially if you're what I am, which is an outgoing introvert, it's it's draining. And if you don't know that about yourself or you have somebody or like a spouse who's an extrovert who's going, okay, you'll feel better if we go out and spend some time with our friends. Um, no, <laughs> you might have fun. And enjoy that, but that won't necessarily replenish your energy. So part of it is managing your energy, making sure that you are refilling your gas tank, whether you're extrovert or introvert, and paying attention to those little warning signs that your intuition tells you about when you're getting to the point you're so drained, you're going to about to tap into your core energy, or you're already in your core energy. So that is the Dr. Deborah Holland conceptualization of burnout. Uh, this I, I I love this explanation uh, of, uh, of 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 burnout. What would you tell someone who works a uh, full time job? So she's using a lot of their they're using a lot of their day to day energy, just getting from the beginning to the day to the end, and they don't have a lot left at the end to to uh, except for that core energy that they can burn off. Well, I would say, again, part of it is knowing whether you're introvert or extrovert. So part of that is going, all right, when I go home, 
even though I might walk into a busy family life or, you know, second job or, or whatever, maybe what I need to do is say, you know what, just give me half an hour. <laughs> family, I love you. Hugs, hugs, kisses all around. I'm going into my room. I'm going to take a nap for half an hour or I'm going to go just listen to that creative sort of calming visualization or you use the drive home. You put on an audio book. That's the kind of audio book you like to listen to. That's going to sort of help you feel better and ignore some of the traffic and transition you from one place to the other. Or you do some deep breathing in the car. You do something that helps replenish you or you at least make yourself the promise of, okay, I'm going to walk into chaos. I have to pay attention to my wife and children. However, I promise myself once everybody goes to bed, and yes, I know that's my writing time, but maybe I need to spend another half hour replenishing my energy before I write. Unless you happen to be in that in the flow of writing, which then will give you energy because it's exciting and the words flow. I think that you know, those kind of times that I'm in that place, which unfortunately don't happen that often. <laughs> it's like, it's like giving you like, you're almost like on drug. It's like a high, but the rest mm -hmm. of the time it's like slogging through the writing. So it might not be the most replenishing thing. So you might have to do something before or after that helps nurture you. I love it. I just have a couple more questions and then I want to talk about, uh, uh your work, uh, as we, as we close out, the first is, um, I, I, you, you are quite successful as a uh, as a writer and as a psychotherapist, and you deal with a lot of successful people. Um, do you have any? Are there any traits that like show up again and again with successful people that you find, or people that have been able to push through and like achieve what they've wanted? Yeah, I think it, it really comes down to determination, and and that is going to play across any any dream that you have, any goal that you have, any, any discipline that you're involved in, then that is you have this stick to itiveness and you don't give up. You keep, you keep going, you keep trying. There might be a point where you go, okay, like I'm trying to be the world's best skier, but my body can no longer <laughs> handle that. So there might be a time when you have to sort of give up in terms of there are a few external circumstances that really are truly limits except for you know, most of the time, most things in life aren't necessarily ultimately limiting. They might be setbacks. So I think it's definitely sticking to something. In fact, if you go to one of the very original sort of self-help motivational books is called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And he was commissioned by Andrew Carnegie, one of the wealthiest men in the world at the time, in like the 30s, 30s, 40s, whatever, 20s to study what made it that the time was men, the most successful men in the world and what made them successful. And one of the things he found was this very quality that a lot of times these people had hit this dark point in their journey towards their goal, the point where most people give up. And these successful men didn't give up. And around the corner, out of sight from that very dark place, was their success. So that's something I try to remind people that when it looks like nothing's working and they're butting their head against the wall, that is this truly a dark time? And is their intuition telling them to do something different? Or is their intuition saying, keep going and don't give up? Love it. And uh, I want to talk, I want to move now to talking about uh, your work. And I'd love uh, for you uh, to, to, to talk a little bit about um, uh, your, up, your, your next release or uh, whatever the, the, the book you're most excited about right now is or, uh, or, or uh, something that you have coming up that you're really uh, passionate about. Well, the book that I'm usually most excited about is when I'm reading somebody else's book. And I've discovered often it's an author that's has a new release. Yay, yay, yay. Or it's a new to me author and they've got a long backlist and I can like read 10 books in like five days. And I'm like happy as a clam except I'm not writing. So back to my own book. My current book I'm working on is called Beyond Montana Sky. And I have a range in my Montana Sky series of big books. 
and the first six were published by my publisher, and the rest are indie books. And so this is one of my big books. It's number 10 of my big books and number, I don't know, 25 maybe, I haven't counted, of sort of all the Montana Sky stories put together. And it's not one that I've had in my head. Usually I have, and it's continue to have, Montana Sky stories, and they're like sort of stacked up in a line waiting to be written. And m- most of the time I actually have the beginnings written many years before I actually write the book. So this book was actually one that kept, my readers kept requesting. They're like, oh, we, want her. we want Edith Grayson's story. And I'm like, she doesn't have a story. <laughs> they kept going, we want her story. And then my editors, we want her story. You realize you have to write her book. You know, you have to write her story. I'm like, I don't know what her story is. <laughs> So, you know, she hasn't been very likable. She's been one of my unlikable characters. And so that means I have to sort of, and I've been redeeming her a little over the series. And, and so I'm like, oh, man. So finally, her story started coming to me. And over the last year or so, I'm like, okay, here it comes. It's, I, I, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. And so I knew her story, but I didn't know her hero. And it also takes place in Montana and in Boston, she, she returns to Boston from where she came many years, you know, like four or five years ago with, with her son. I'm like, okay, is it going to be a Boston guy? Is it going to be a Montana guy? Does she stay in Boston? Did she come back to Montana? And so it took a while. And then I was like, okay, maybe I'll make him a rancher. And, and then the first scene came to me, which is always a relief when that happens. Because like I said, it often happens many years in advance. And so I started writing the story and this rancher turned out to be so sort of irreverent and funny and totally different from my very proper wealthy hero and 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 the way he was starting to poke fun at her and tease her and I was like this is going to be fun <laughs> I, I might actually have fun with this book so that's that's where I am now writing Edith's story can you can you uh, can you talk a little bit about the Montana Sky series as a whole? Because as you mentioned, like what's great is when you find an author who you just met, uh, who you just found out, and they have a huge backlist. Then, like you, you counted twenty five. Uh, you're probably closer th- than me. I counted twenty six on your website for this particular series. But could you talk a little bit about it? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it started as one book. It started as what you know, Wild Montana Sky, and and I was started writing it in nineteen ninety eight. And my editor and my friends at the author friends at the time said, well, you know, you have to write a series. So I came up with a second idea and, and then eventually sort of conceptualized the series as four books. And, you know, like I said, it won the Golden Heart, got it, got an agent from that agent, sent the book around and I got a stack of rejections. And I also had written the fantasies and, got another stack of objections for those. And then the agent sort of got discouraged and I ended up firing him and then got another agent who, and we had a second round and another round of rejections. So it was like, I would get these feedback that says, good book doesn't fit our market because it wasn't sexy and it was historical Western, which again, that was that part of time was not a popular genre. So even though, so I wrote the first two, wrote 60 pages of the third one and then set it aside and did a bunch of this other stuff, which I told you about nonfiction, actually focused on nonfiction. Cause I was like, all right, even if I don't sell my nonfiction books, I can always sell them myself at the back of the room when I give a talk. So it wasn't until indie publishing came along that I resurrected Wild Montana Sky and Starry Montana Sky and sold them and they took off. Cause I hit two, underpublished genres, which was the sweet romance and more chase romance and historical Western romance. So they took off, so wrote the third book and got some ideas for some Christmas stories and wrote a collection of that. And then I had um, an incident. I was dating someone at the time who had a boat and we had a Newport Harbor. And the first time I took my dog, my Sheltie down there with us, I put her in the back of the boat, and he went off to move the car. I went off to the restroom on, on, on the dock, and I came back to the boat, and the dog was gone. And I panicked. I started calling her. She didn't come. And I'm like, oh, my God, she's in the water. I can't find her. I'm screaming for her and thinking, oh, my God. 
if something happens to her, I will never forgive myself. And yeah, I'm screaming for her. And finally, somebody, in, one of the other doctors goes, she's in the water, and sort of points to the water between us. And I go running to the end of the boat slip, and I see her in the water and call her to me. And she's, she's struggling. And luckily, I had just had her groomed and her undercoat taken out. And so otherwise, who knows? So she comes swimming over to me, and I grab her fur. She's too heavy for me to pull out, but some guys come running, and they pull us out. And I'm just holding her and I'm sobbing because you know she's safe and I was so scared so I took her back to the boat and curled up with her with towels and uh, on one of the beds and I'm just going oh my god oh my god what I have to do something with these feelings and I put the ass like okay okay I'll, I'll put them in a story I'll put them in a story so I start thinking but it's like Montana there's no oceans in Montana okay okay I'll be a river and the herd the heroine's dog falls into a river and almost rounds. And so all of a sudden, the story starts coming to me, and I start calming down. My heartbeat slows. And the feeling that I come up with this story, and it was my first novella. And it's been done very, very well. And it taught me that I could write stories of different lengths. So I have my Christmas stories that are short. I have my big books. And then I started doing novellas and books of a size between novellas and my big books. And my readers are just happy to have anything. It's like, oh, good. It's a Montana Sky story. Fine. What is the different, the size difference between the novellas and the novels? Well, my novellas are longer. Some people might call them novels for their books. But if it's 45K, 45,000 words and under, between like 20 and 45 is a novella for me. Less than 20,000 words is a short story. Uh, and then the 45 to 70 range is like a book, like some of my shorter books. And then above 70 is, for my, my task guy, is my big book. My fantasies are, and space operas are much bigger than that. So that's what I, that's how I conceptualize it for me and sort of price accordingly. Uh, makes sense. It's always nice to know what someone considers. I have a friend who considers a short book 80,000 words and a long book like over like 150 to 200,000. And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, so it's always nice to hear what like different authors think of as a short book versus a long book. Well, science fiction and fantasy also tend to be longer, a longer genre than than romance does. And, and the romance used to have like really, really big books and doesn't necessarily anymore. So mine tend to be on the, the larger side for many romances, but that's how it works. And it also is the, – the positive thing is it gives my readers different portals into the series. They can start at Christmas time when I'm advertising my Christmas stories. They can start with the Christmas stories and go into the series from there. They can start with my prequel, which I actually wrote many years later, but it's the prequel to the book, to the series Beneath Montana Sky, and it's – 99 cents or they can you know pick up any of the books they're all standalone they just take place in the same town with reoccurring heroes and heroes you'll see them again so the town is really a character too the hard part is is that i can't on amazon and other booksellers i can't do a book one book two book three book four and include all the shorter books because <laughs> amazon doesn't go okay you have a 1.5 here Right. You have to go one, two. And so only my big books are numbered. And then the other ones are like, some of them are like sub series. Like so if you could tell somebody now, because it's not Christmas time anymore, like where, where would you think would be the best sort of starting place? Which book for, uh, for somebody? Well, go ahead and start with my prequel, which is called uh, Beneath My Task Sky, and it's 99 cents. And, you know, that sort of starts, starts chronologically starts the series. Like I said, it wasn't my first book, but it's chronologically the beginning. Or awesome. They, or they can go to the fantasy, which is Sower of Dreams. Awesome. Okay, so last question. And then I uh, – so most people, uh, when they're listening to a podcast, they're driving in their car or they're on their drawing desk or something. So this is when I ask them to come back and pay attention for just the next couple of minutes when you impart to them the piece of wisdom that you would like them to leave this podcast with. Uh, it could be something you've said before. It could be something that you've uh, 
that you've uh, said uh, that you knew that you haven't mentioned yet. And then also give the people where they can find you online so they can get to know you better. Well, I'm assuming most people listening to this co- podcast are writers or, you know, pretending, wanting to be writers. And so I would say what I've said before, which is learn your craft and don't give up. And then if you want to find out more about me, it's my website. It's very easy. It's just DebraHolland.com. So D-E-B-R-A, Holland, like the country. Awesome. Thank you so much for stopping by, Deborah. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. And we are out. We did it. Yay. We made a show. Every time I always have that pit, that, that thing in the pit of my stomach. And then I look, but I looked up this time after we had been talking for a little bit and I was like, oh my God, 30 minutes. I've got to get to the next thing. We've got to like talk. We've got so much more to talk about. So I, I always love you. when that happens. <laughs> I warned you. You were warned. <laughs> I know it's wonderful. Like I love my favorite interviews are the ones where I ha- can just like learn and not have to be. So especially with people that don't do a lot of podcasts or don't like talk a lot on stage, uh, it, it's a lot harder to coax the interview out of them. And so I end up having to spend a lot of time figuring out where the interview is going instead of like absorbing the interview and making it feel more like natural. So I love it when somebody can just sort of go off and like say really, really uh, uh, make salient points. And then I can just like very gently flow the conversation instead of having to sort of steer it. Yeah. And you have to go, wait a minute. I want to talk more about that, but maybe my, my listeners want something different. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the nice thing is the show is like for the things that I, it's it's always sort of what I've been going through. It's, it's interesting that we're recording this now because I had two doctor's appointments yesterday and both of them was like, have you dealt with your severe clinical depression yet? And I was like, no, I haven't. I'm going to go make an appointment. And now it's like the number one thing on my agenda. And like, I just talked to you. So now I'm even more motivated to like go and call and make an appointment with my psychologist so we could start the year right. Good. Good for you. You know, and we can do another show if you want that really focuses on that because I do do a lot of talking on stress and anxiety and depression for the author and, you know, living a healthy life and and that kind of thing. So I would repeat some of the things I said on this show, but we could also go into more depth on it. Wonderful. That sounds uh, that sounds great. Well, I I, I really appreciate it. I, my favorite part of this show is meeting uh, wonderful people and then having an hour a week that I've carved out where I get to know them better and make uh, deeper connections with them. So uh, so thank you so much for taking the time. Um, and uh, I started this show again just so I could literally meet people like you and talk to them more and get to know them better. So. Well, good luck. Your Kickstarter looks like it's going gangbusters. So good luck with that. It looks like way way too much work. (laughs) I've been watching you. I've been, oh my God, this is so much work. It's so much work. I'll be honest. It's so much like, but I I don't know if you know, uh, I I, I tried to release these books. Uh, Some of them are actually on Amazon right now and they did so poorly and they lost so much money for me that like, this is the reconceptualization of this in a way that I could hopefully claw back to even on them. Um, so I did not plan to do this on Kickstarter. I was hoping that like all of the things I would be doing on Amazon would work and they just, uh, they, 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 they have not as of yet. So this is, uh, this is not my ideal, but I'm very good at, uh, taking, uh, lemons and making lemonade out of that. So hopefully this is a way to, you know, celebrate my most popular universe and pull me out of a great big hole that I dug for myself. I hope so too. You know, maybe the next time around, not this time, because like I said, I'm, I'm looking with covers and, and re- rebranding my fantasy series. But if you want a book, or you know, if you want one, throw one, one of my books into your pot, I be I would be fine with that. Oh, that'd be wonderful. I love it. Yeah, I have a bunch for, uh, for uh, I try to give first in series as sort of like bundles for uh, it's like one thing to like reward the backers for with like with extra books for them backing now, but also so that they could find a bunch of new authors. So I would love to have a book from you. Yeah, OK. So like I said, we're we're still working on changing the covers and yeah, it'll probably be not for in the, a year. So there's plenty of time for that. Great. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I will let you get on with your day. Thank you so much. And I will let you know when this airs. Okay. Sounds good. Have a great day. All right. right. Bye. So that was Dr. Deborah Holland. I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. 
If you did, make sure to find Deborah on social media and head on over to thecompletecreative.com to check out all of our courses, podcasts, and a whole lot more. And please, please, please don't forget to rate, subscribe, and review this show. It really does help. It's the only way that I know what you guys like or not like. Of course, you could always send me an email at russell at wannabepress.com and let me know as well. Thank you so much. Have a great day. I'll talk to you next time.